my uh, September 11 um, experience, uh, physically, I started behind the eight ball um, because I came into work. I was a battalion chief in Battalion 5-8. My office was in a firehouse in Canarsie, Brooklyn, very busy uh, section of Brooklyn. And uh, so September 10th was, uh, was a Monday. I went in for a nine o'clock tour that would end at nine o'clock in the morning on September 11th. So we call that a day into night, a 24 hour shift. The day tour was nothing special. Uh, the night tour happened to be exceptionally busy. We had uh, you know, several fires and emergencies, so we were pretty much running all night. So now the next morning, uh, I have all of the paperwork and everything on my desk. I wasn't in a hurry to get home. Uh, my wife uh, was a, a nurse at Long Island Jewish Hospital. I knew that she was working. Uh, my daughter, Megan, was uh, 11 years old and, of course, uh, in school all day. So no rush for me um, to get home. I'm a news junkie. Uh, I have the news on anyway. So after having been down in the kitchen with everyone, uh, you know, talking or went upstairs to kind of just clear up the paperwork so I wouldn't have to deal with it um, my next shift when I came back in. So as I'm doing that uh, with the news on, the events of the day are beginning to unfold. And uh, at first notice, it didn't seem like it was anything out of the uh, extreme norm that, you know, a, a plane and it was reported that a commuter plane had struck one of the uh, World Trade Center towers. Uh, nothing that hasn't happened before in the city. And I'm kind of just like half paying attention. It's, you know, of, of interest, but it's not like a spectacular, you know, event. And I'm, you know, I'm working and I'm working. And then, you know, uh, what everybody's seen and, uh, and realized that uh, it wasn't that, that it had been a, a, a commercial airliner. And uh, now I'm kind of fixated on what's going on. You know, this is uh, absolutely incredible. And as a, as a chief officer, I'm just imagining myself if I was working in one of the battalions in lower Manhattan, uh, what I might be thinking and what our approach might be with the elevators and all of the, of the first tower, would that be impacted? How would we get upstairs? It's going to be an incredibly arduous uh, operation to get up. I mean, this was one of the upper floors, you know, like 80th floor. So you have to get all of this equipment up. And I figured that the elevators were not going to be an option to at least transport them. And so as that's going on, um, the second plane hit the second tower. I'm still in my battalion. And I realized that, uh, that this is going to be uh, a citywide uh, event. And as I get that thought, the New York City Fire Department uh, institutes a total recall of all members. So the fire department is divided into nine divisions citywide. So when they do a citywide recall, they call each division a mustering site. So everyone assigned to division one goes to division one headquarters and division three and five and on and on down the line. I'm in division 15 at the time and the 15th division was in Brownsville. So we gather up everyone, you know, uh, firefighters and officers are responding from home to get to the division. I'm already in Brooklyn and we get over to uh, uh, Brownsville and uh, begin the operation of loading, getting uh, additional equipment, uh, staffing, city buses were brought in. Uh, as this is going on, uh, we're, of course, in, in contact with uh, operations uh, downtown. And uh, before I even get on the bus, uh, I find out that uh, the first tower uh, had collapsed. So uh, that uh, became a, a game changer as far as command and control, because I'm thinking, OK, uh, we just lost. I have no idea how many uh, civilians that are in the building in the process of being evacuated and all of the firefighters and fire officers that were operating in that, in that tower. So it's kind of like a real smack in the head. We, we, we all get a sense of urgency and we continue because it was still, uh, logistically a very difficult operation of getting everyone together. So, 
we're on the buses uh, finally, and we begin to uh, our transport, and uh, we get notice that the second tower has uh, collapsed. And I'm telling you, uh, a bus load of maybe 50 of us, because of all the equipment and everything, there were maybe six buses in, the, in this uh, chain, were probably, you could hear a pin drop for a few moments. And then everyone uh, uh, got themselves together and uh, a couple of the commanding chiefs, uh, the guys that outranked me, uh, you know, got up and began talking about uh, what we could expect when we got there. I was already running my own thoughts in, in my mind. So we arrived uh, on scene at one of the command posts and uh, maybe 20 minutes after the second collapse. Uh, I was happy that I had advanced uh, knowledge of what happened. I mean, if we had not been in communication and I just arrived on the scene and seen that, I don't know how I would have dealt with it, but I had adequate amount of time to uh, gather my thoughts about what we were going to do. There was no time to, to mourn and, and try to grasp the devastating uh, life loss because in my mind, as uh, when your training kicks in, I fully expected to now be part of the largest search and rescue operation in our lifetime on American soil. And it was like, wow. So that's how we approached it. People have asked me, you know, did I, did I look beyond that at the broader issues and all? And I say, no, you, you can't. We had a job. This, I mean, it's the size of the World Trade Center site and with all of the devastation, it was broken down into, into grids. You can't run around and you know, do all these things. We had plenty of, uh, of staffing uh, to, to accommodate all of the tasks at, at hand. And, uh, and that's how uh, the day began. So it's like maybe, I don't know, 12.30, one o'clock-ish. And um, we were, you know, my job was to supervise uh, search and, and, and rescue teams. And we would find uh, some promising voids. And I remember being, you know, excited because this is where we would expect to find, you know, pockets of people as, as, as you got in. I mean, I had no idea that uh, everything had been pushed down so low because if you can remember what the pit looked like in January, February, March, April of 2002, this deep crater, uh, that's where all the floors have pressed down as we slowly, you know, dug in. But that day, everything's on level ground. So as you come across a void, and you can sure it up. That's when I expected to just see pockets of people. And, and this would go on, you know, through the day uh, and into the night. And a promising lead would end up, you know, nowhere. And it would have required more heavy equipment to be able to move to, to, to get it up. So uh, we'd move on to, a, to another area. The same thing would happen you know, a void would, would unfold. We would work into it and get as far as we could without the heavy machinery and then uh, find no one. So uh, that night, maybe seven, eight o'clock at night, it was like the mechanical Marines that all of these heavy machines came across into ground zero. Cranes, tractors, all of this mechanical equipment, which would be put to use to now get into all of those craters that we had begun opening to get down deeper. And that's pretty much how the whole first night uh, went. Uh, if I have one memory of 9-11, of it's that, um, that whole period, because I'll, I'll speak more about that uh, later, uh, is overwhelming exhaustion. I've never been more exhausted in my life. And this would go on for nine months. So uh, long into the night, 
nothing exciting, you know, to uh, uh, to relay because nothing exciting happened except just work and frustration. Uh, would I remember, uh, you know, going from here to there, uh, bumping into uh, colleagues who uh, weren't just people that I knew on the job, but were close friends. And whenever you ran into someone, uh, you just immediately we hug, and no words needed to be uh, expressed. It was uh, I was very fortunate in the fire department to have two uh, best friends, and one of them uh, is missing. His name was uh, Eddie Garrity. He was a fellow, uh, excuse me, he was a fellow battalion chief, uh, a, a man I had met coming into the fire department. His father had been a captain and uh, he was forming a study group. Uh, it would become a group of uh, six of us that would study through all of the ranks. All of us made it all the way up to the chief's rank. So we were together a long time. Uh, our group was very tight. Uh, we, uh, uh, we would go out socially uh, every couple of months so that our wives, you know, because it was a, a great sacrifice to study for promotion in the, in the fire department. And we wanted, you know, our wives to understand that, you know, speaking to other wives, the sacrifice, everybody was doing the same. It wasn't just, you know, my husband who's not around, who can't make this birthday party because, you know, there's a practical exam next week and they got to get ready and all of this stuff. So it was good. So, um, so Eddie Garrity is, uh, is, is missing. He's, he's married at the time. And I bumped into his brother-in-law, who was an NYPD sergeant. I didn't have a cell phone. Uh, was I wouldn't get a cell phone for a couple of years after that. But he has a cell phone, and and Ed, Eddie Garrity's wife Mary is calling her brother uh, constantly because she knows that Eddie's missing. And he's and he, and he when he sees me, he says like, you know, what do I tell him? I said, well, just tell her the truth, actually. I said, you know, there's, there's chaos here. And, and really, and, and I, I mean this truthfully, I fully expected to find a whole bunch of us, fire personnel, emergency personnel, and civilians. We just, it was just going to take the better part of a couple of weeks, but we're going we're gonna to find them. So you tell her that it's chaos, he very well could be here and communications. And this was the truth also, the cell phones really weren't working. I mean, his was working because unfortunately for him, because she was uh, torturing him with the, with the calls. Uh, but that was, that was a vivid memory and uh, almost, you know, made me pause a little bit to, to take a moment and reflect on uh, how many others that, uh, you know, of my friends and colleagues that I was going to find out we're also in that uh, situation. So I worked probably until four or five o'clock in the morning. And uh, one of the command chiefs, when I went back to the command post, the, you know, took a look at me and said, uh, Richie, you're done. Uh, I got me a lift back to my command in uh, Canarsie. So I got there in the, in the wee hours of the morning. Uh, everybody was was up like I said this is a busy uh, firehouse these were members that had worked you know all night in the firehouse so of course everybody wants to know what's going on everybody that was getting off of course was going to go work down at the trade center so I spent the the whole morning uh, drinking coffee and kind of trying to uh, give them a sense of uh, what it was like and what they were going what they could expect and how the operation would go. So I caught some sleep in the firehouse. Actually, I, I called my, uh, I called my wife to let her know that uh, everything was okay and gave her an update. Um, I, I want to just backtrack a little bit um, just because when I was in the office, cause you would ask, you know, did my, did my wife know what was going on? Did my daughter, my, uh, I, I, I called my wife from uh, the battalion office at work at the hospital. She was at Long Island Jewish. And, uh, you know, we spoke and I told her that, you know, I was going to end up, you know, being down there and don't worry, you know, I'll be safe because this is, uh, you know, continuing operation. We know what we're doing. 
and you know and she had full confidence it wasn't even like i don't think she I don't think she worried that uh, that something was going to happen to me. I think she probably worried that something was going to happen to the people that were already there. Uh, so, said that um, she said that she would uh, she was being held over because they expected mass casualties in all of the hospitals. And so I hung up there, and then uh, I get a call in the battalion office. A close friend of mine, uh, Mike Norwood, who is a Rockville Center. We were living in Rockville Center, Long Island, at the time. Uh, Mike Nord was a detective in the Rockville Center Police Department. Uh, our daughters were the same age. Uh, they played on the same travel soccer team. And this was, uh, this was a soccer team who it seemed like everybody's uh, father or mother on the team was either a doctor or a lawyer. And then there's this fire guy and the cop. So we became instant uh, buddies. And uh, so he... Um, he called me up and he wanted to know, you know, what, what, what's going on? What are you doing? And I told him where I was and, and, and obviously that, you know, I have to go as a total recall. And he's like, you know, lecturing me and he saw, and, and I have to say this about Mike Norwood. He's one tough piece of work. He starts bawling on the phone, you know, crying. It scared the living crap out of me to hear him, you know, sobbing and telling me that I better be careful. So uh, in, a, in a crazy sort of way, this was like a scare for my wife um, because Mike knew, knew that I was down there. Mike knew that my wife was uh, working. Uh, my wife, Dinah, had made arrangements with a friend of hers like after school to pick Megan up. You know, again, another, another uh, girl, same age. Mike Norwood, goes to school to pick up his daughter that day and decides to proactively just grab my daughter, Megan, and take her home, figuring, you know, whatever in, in, in all of this that uh, we're going to not make arrangements. So my wife, Dinah's friend now comes to school to pick up her daughter and to get my daughter. And, and the school administrator, rather than tell her uh, Mike Norwood has her, which would have been okay, no problem, says that a police officer came to school to get Megan. So for a while, my wife was frantic when she found that out because why would a police officer until he found out it was, you know, Mike Norwood and, you know, and she probably smacked, smacked him in the face a couple of times. But, uh, you know, that was, uh, you know, one scary moment uh, for her. So anyway, uh, back to uh, back to ground zero again on another transport went uh, late in the afternoon of September 12th, worked uh, through the night, uh, came back to the firehouse again. Uh, I called home uh, to say that I needed to stay one more day uh, because uh, they really needed every, every single uh, person, especially uh, officers in the, in, the, in the chief's rank. So, you know, my wife understood. And, and so September 13th was the same. Again, in the afternoon, uh, went down to Ground Zero, continuing saga of arduous uh, work with no accomplishment whatsoever. And uh, after a couple of days of this, I start to realize, gee, is it possible that we're not gonna find anybody? And I wasn't, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't convinced at all. The, uh, the fire department uh, changed the work schedule and they had us working at that time uh, 24 hours on, 24 hours off. And you might go, go to the trade center or you might be working in your firehouse because all of the firehouses had to be staffed. So, uh, and it's kind of incredible. Uh, I, the luck of the draw, I ended up the next couple of 24 hour shifts being assigned, not in the firehouse, but at the, at the trade center. And it was maybe, uh, maybe a week later um, that I worked my first 24 hour shift in the firehouse post 9-11. And it was incredible how uh, dead the entire city was. It's like nothing was happening. 
all of the things that happen uh, hundreds of times a day, like somebody burning food, uh, gas leaks, fires, it's like nothing. I don't even know if there was a, a, a fire for a couple of weeks in, in the city. It's like, why? What? Is everybody just frozen and just watching TV and, and watching all of this? I, I, I don't know. But to work in a firehouse was like a day off. It was almost, it was, uh, I, I, taking a step back, I realized, oh my God, how fortunate I am to be in this job. I love this place, you know, and, and, and so conflicted in the fact that uh, I'm here working in the firehouse. So it's like, thank God I can, I can rest because we're not doing anything and I should be down uh, at ground zero looking for my, looking for my friends. So that's a tough one to, to, to juggle. Uh, in your mind, but uh, you know, the the successful ones, and fortunately, I am are people that are able to uh, compartmentalize things. I've seen a lot in my career. Uh, this uh, the same thing, but if you can do that, then you can get through it. And uh, so many others of my colleagues uh, were, you know, years later, unable to do that, and it's caused uh, untold. Uh, damage to uh, to families uh, with with members suffering from uh, post traumatic stress syndrome, which is really uh, which is really a terrible thing. Never having dealt with it, you know, myself, but seeing it on the other end, it's 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 heart wrenching to watch families, you know, get get destroyed because this person can never recover, that they can never they can never move on. But continuing with the, the, the frustration of the, of the work schedule, the uh, fire department then shifted and went to uh, one week uh, details to the Trade Center. So you would go to uh, Shea Stadium if you were assigned for that week, and then buses would transport us from Shea Stadium to Ground Zero to begin our work at that time, then they, they broke the trade center down into uh, four quadrants. There was a command post at each quadrant and just the command structure would be, you know, broken down from the ranking chief at that command post to the chiefs below him and then all the other officers and you would get your assigned tags for the, uh, for the tour. So uh, I remember, you know, being on the buses and uh, seeing as we got close, seeing the faces of people that uh, held up signs, encouraging us, holding up uh, pictures of their loved ones that are missing. And I would just really see and look at many of them and almost like wanting to stop the bus to go out to tell them, we're not going to find your loved one. I mean, this is what's going on in my head. It's crazy. You know, it's a crazy thought, but I'm just, I'm just frozen into like thinking, oh God, and uh, just you know, knowing how long and how uh, difficult the uh, the task would be. So that continued into uh, you know into October, uh, but early October, it pretty much you realize that it's no longer a search and rescue operation and it becomes a recovery operation, which was also uh, a, a different mindset. Uh, but the reward of that is really in trying to uh, find people, whether they were civilians for their loved ones or trying to find uh, emergency workers also for their, for their loved ones, uh, but giving closure to, to families. So that began, you know, late, October is when probably the first uh, recoveries started being made. The, uh, the fire department, and I think the police department was doing this too, went to a monthly rotation. You were assigned uh, a month there, and then uh, you would go back to your regular uh, command. So I was there in the month of uh, November of 2001. And then I wouldn't return until March of 2002. 
and uh, drastically different uh, in the landscape from November to March. So that big crater that I was talking about uh, by the time I got there in March uh, was, geez, we, we seem to be uh, 10 stories, maybe more into the ground, you know, gigantic, gigantic area. And uh, that winter, the reason why the operation was able to be concluded in May and only take nine months was because it was an exceptionally warm winter. And uh, they were able to each month do incredible work. So when, when I got there in March, I was surprised how many uh, recoveries we would make because I was there for 12 hour shifts. So the entire operation was with the FDNY were two separate groups working 12 hours. My group of uh, people, we found, we made 80 recoveries. And recoveries, you know, would be the, the, the gruesome part of finding uh, you know, bits and pieces of, of, of people. You would almost, um, everyone came pretty, uh, pretty eagle-eyed in, in spotting something that was, you know, potentially a, a body part to find for recovery. And that's how they would make the ID on people. Or in the case of uh, firefighters and fire officers was uh, the bunker gear, you know, or a mass cylinder, uh, a helmet. We found a lot of that. And the, uh, the ceremonial aspect of, of making a recovery was, is, is another lasting uh, image in my mind. Whenever we found a, a member of service, uh, everything would stop. And that removal would be made, would all do caution to gather everything possible. It would be put on a uh, Stokes stretcher with an American flag and all of us would line up on the ramp leading out. And if it was a member of service, uh, a, a call and, and we could identify, you know, if it was a police officer would have a name on, on, uh, on a, a uniform, the fire department members, the gear has their name on it, tag, helmet, same thing. Call would be made uh, to the to the firehouse so uh, members would come down so they could actually escort their their brother out of the uh, out of the pit uh, very dramatic um, and very respectful and uh, you know makes one realize how uh, fortunate you know we are to be in this in this in this work I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's God's work to do, but to see the, the relief in families just on having an identification. So that's, uh, I mean, it's not, it's not a fancy story. It's just a story of, uh, of work, of trial and tribulation intermixed with, I tried to get to, uh, and this is another thing I held myself back from, uh, and I have guilt from time to time, I went to uh, the funerals and later memorial services for people. I realized I couldn't do it all. I mean, you know, I, I was, I don't mind saying I, I was exhausted and, and it was like, it was tough to just keep it together to just, you know, do my job and remain strong, you know, for my family. So they, they didn't worry about me, but I went to the funerals and later memorials to people uh, that I knew really well. And I felt like, you know, I had to go. It was like, no, well, I, I'm, I'm not going to go today because uh, I worked all night and I'm, I'm tired. So I, I did that. So I went to a fair amount of them, but I didn't go to every every one of them, you know, as opposed to uh, members of the fight department bagpipe band who uh, were at every single funeral and every single memorial. Uh, just, you know, just, just, just in, incredible. Just incredible. And, you know, I mean, here I am. As I tape this, 19 will be 20 years uh, removed. 
and uh, I don't often sit around and, and, and dwell on it, but when I talk about it like I am now, it's like it was yesterday. Well, that's, that's, that's pretty much, pretty much it. How was your health after spending so much time at Ground Zero? We all know that that air was poison and most poisonous to those who were closest to Ground Zero, yeah. which is where you were working for months. Um, like you, I'm a, a avid uh, physical fitness buff, and and also uh, you know for the job it was uh, really important. Uh, so I was I was an avid runner and uh, a gym rat. And uh, my buddy Eddie Gary, who I spoke about before, uh, we were partners in that. We ran races together. Him and I ran uh, two marathons together, and we work out in the gym together. So, uh, you know, maybe a week after when I was home and uh, wanted to go for a run, I couldn't run more than, uh, than a couple of blocks. And my lungs were, were tight and I had what they call uh, reactive airway um, disease. So uh, I was scared because I, what's the rest of my life? going to be like, you know, it was uh, really as I hope. And uh, it took maybe, even though uh, the ground zero operation was still going on, but by then, you know, later on when we had effective mass and all uh, to work, it took maybe three months or so, but my lungs sort of cleared up and I was able to uh, get back to a, a normal, uh, you know, workout and run. You know, it was almost like having an injury and then I had to work my way back, but I, I got there. But years later, uh, I did uh, develop uh, skin cancer, which I was fortunate that um, a fire department doctor happened to notice something. I mean, and I'm shaving every day and I didn't even notice. I thought it was a, a freckle, but uh, he sent me to a dermatologist and it turned out to be uh, uh, skin cancer, which now, of course, is a a very uh, common uh, cancer in the 9-11 uh, community. But, um, you know, it was not life-threatening in, in my case. It could have been had it not been discovered. I don't know when I would have gotten around to, you know, hey, what's this? So that's been my only, um, my only personal uh, battle with, uh, with illness. So um, knock on wood, um, good so far. Although all of us consider ourselves, myself included, uh, a ticking time bomb. You rose through the ranks of the fire department, deputy chief. You were you worked for the union, and now you have really dedicated your life to the 9/11 community. Those who are ailing of illnesses, what led you to that decision? Well, in um, in 2007. Um, two things happened. I uh, had thrown my hat in the ring for an open position in my union, the Uniform Fire Officers Association, and I got promoted to, uh, to deputy chief. So uh, I won that election and, uh, you know, came in and I had been speaking about a lot of things, but the health and compensation was actively being talked about because the illnesses that we were told by the medical professionals back in 2001 that we could expect to see cancers in possibly 10 or 20 years, the respiratory ailments, you know, much sooner, began unfolding almost immediately. Cancers were showing up a year, two years later. So in 2006, Detective James Droga had passed away and you know we were fighting with the federal government and and new york city government about the toxicity of the air so that was still being debated and uh detective zadroga who died of pulmonary fibrosis was a client of michael barish prominent uh 9-11 uh, attorney who i who i now work for uh convinced the family 
to have an autopsy done on Detective Zajoga his lungs when he passed away in 2006. And when they, when they opened up his lungs, they found everything that we were claiming had been in the air, ground glass, benzene, asbestos, heavy metals. And that gave us the forensic evidence that we needed to pursue this legislation. So I was tasked as the leg legislative and political director for the fire officers in, in conjunction with the New York State AFL-CIO and my international union, the IAFF, to lobby on behalf of getting what would become the James Droga 9-11 Health and Compensation Act. But I was uh, privileged to be tapped as one of the lobbyists for the AFL-CIO, even though I was, you know, I was representing the fire officers. Dennis Hughes at the time was, was president. His executive assistant was Susie Valentine. And they put teams together. But I ended up on the team with, with Dennis Hughes, who was a, a, a labor icon in, in New York State. Absolutely incredible. And he took me under his wing and I learned the ropes and I learned uh, how to make your case to Republicans and to Democrats, to how to walk that delicate aisle, how to have a few minutes of someone's time and be able to say only what you want to say and only what's significant because you only have that short window and you need to be able to make your case. And, and if you don't, well, then you blew that, that, that three minutes. And so in 2010, of course, uh, we were successful, got the law passed, but it was only good for five years. And I wasn't worried at the time uh, because I knew the, the statistics that were coming down that you know when we went back to get it uh, extended, uh, surely they would see it would be an even easier task to get it restored. And, and that didn't happen. We had a fight for close to two years, right down to the wire, to get the law extended in 2015. And they created the, the, the World Trade Center Health Program was made permanent, but unfortunately the Victim Compensation Fund, the most important uh, uh, part of this for the financial well-being of all of these families that were dealing with horrendous illnesses and losing their, their breadwinner, was only extended for five years. So <laughs> the fight, you know, the, that, that victim compensation fund was slated to expire at the end of 2020, began running out of money in uh, late 2018 and a year early with that in Washington fighting to get that done. So along the way in 2016, after 38 years and after three, three year terms of my union, uh, I decided, you know, enough was enough. I had spent a lot of time away from my family. The union job uh, is very time consuming between long days and uh, political functions at night. Uh, the lobbying between going to Washington and going to Albany, you know, it was time to uh, take a step back. And I pretty, I thought that was it for me. And uh, Michael Barish called me and uh, had a proposal, had a different idea for me. And I said, you know what, I still got some fire in the belly. I still want to be able to uh, work for 9-11 first responders. I thought first responders until uh, in working for the law firm, I became exposed to the 9-11 community. And, uh, you know, again, in my line of work, uh, tunnel vision, my job was to, uh, you know, represent fire officers and firefighters and, and union labor in the city with the AFL-CIO. And it was up for other people to, uh, you know, worry about the survivors, you know, the, the teachers and the students and the people that worked in Wall Street and the residents. Uh, a population of over 400,000 people. And it wasn't until I began working for the law firm that I realized that the survivors, and I call them the forgotten group of the 9-11 community, had no one speaking out for them. That all of this great work that we did in Washington and getting this extraordinary law uh, passed and after patting ourselves on the back, nobody was informing all of these people who it affected. So, and if I didn't work for the law firm, I wouldn't find out about 
uh, a college student who was in grammar school during 9-11 and, uh, you know, is now uh, in another part of the country and comes down with a cancer. And their first thought isn't, gee, I wonder if it was when I was, uh, you know, in grammar school uh, on Houston Street or something like that. And uh, my eyes opened up and I, I made a vow. And I, I think it was at probably one of the first functions that I went to with, with Michael. And we were speaking to not um, first responders who all pretty much know about the law, although we're still looking for some first responders, but it was a group of uh, just you know community people that uh, were exposed for various reasons. And I made a vow that I would spend the rest of my uh, professional uh, career uh, looking and educating that population. And anybody that's sick, I wanna make sure that we get them the compensation that they're uh, that they're entitled to. So um, <laughs> it's an arduous task to find all these people, but uh, I'm going to give it my my best shot. There's only one thought that I've had this whole time that doesn't make sense to me, and I don't know if there is an easy solution to this. It seems to me, you know, the government did the right thing got the World Trade Center Health Program together and the Victim Compensation Fund, and then left it up to individuals to find out about it. Now, if you or I owed the IRS money, they would find us. Yeah. Now, it seems to me the government has a way of finding everyone in that community. There are records outside of the volunteers, I would say. There are records you work there. There are records you live there. There are records you went to school there. Why can we not get the government to do its job? And I mean, it would put you out of work. But this is, but this is to me, this, I, I can't wrap my head around. Why, why can this not happen? Yeah. Um, two thoughts. One, I mean, that's a, that's a question for our elected leaders there to, uh, uh, to bring uh, to the floor of Congress. But number two, uh, I'll take the cynical approach and say, well, the federal government stepped up and said, okay, yeah, we told you the air was safe to breathe. Uh, shame on us, it wasn't. So if you get sick, then we're going to take care of you financially. I don't think they want to find anyone. You know, you're on your own for that. It's a cynical uh, thought, but that's how I feel. Anything else you want to add, Richie? I mean, these, these are difficult times and, and uh, in light of everything that's going on now in the midst of a pandemic and uh, civil unrest everywhere, I wish that somehow, some way, if anything good came out of 9-11, it was the aftermath and the sense of a united America across all lines, all races, all political affinities. Um, I, I long for that. You know, and, and it's really what makes America uh, what it is to be able to overcome all of these things. And I hope that uh, we somehow can uh, right our ship and, and continue in that, in that path. That's my, that's my hope and my prayer. Thank you, Richie.